Hello, everyone. Welcome today to today's live broadcast of Less False Negatives, Quantifying Cell Viability by Simultaneous Triple Staining. I'm Dr. Mike Kowalski, Staff Application Scientist at Beckman Coulter, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Beckman Coulter. Beckman Coulter Life Sciences develops comprehensive solutions in laboratory automation, flow cytometry, centrifugation, particle characterization, and genomics reagents to help drive scientific discovery. For more information, please visit BeckmanCoulter.com. Before we start, here are a few instructions. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. At the conclusion of the presentation, we will try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button. I would now like to introduce today's speakers. Oliver Kep received his PhD in 2006 from the Humboldt University of Berlin and the Max Planck Institute for Infection Biology in Berlin, Germany. He is currently a research scientist in the laboratory of Guido Kramer, where he investigates several aspects of immunogenic cell death, focusing on systems bio biology approaches. Alain Souvent received his engineer's degree in 2011 from the Institut Supérieur du Biensciences in Paris, France. He is now a research engineer on the BioCell platform in Villejuif, France, where he is focusing on HDS assay and software development for systems biology. I will now turn it over to Oliva and Alain for their presentations. Hi. I think we're on. So welcome to today's uh, webinar. Um, Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're dialing in from. Um, it's my pleasure to, um, to present our BioCell platform and especially one essay, one multiplexing essay that we have been developing and they, we actually let it published in OncoTarget, um, which is dealing with the quantification of cell viability by a simultaneous triple stain. So, as Mike already introduced us, um, my name is Oliver. I am the uh, head of the BioCell platform at the Institut Gustave Roussy in Paris. I will give you a short introduction into the technical aspects and probably the decision making that we initially uh, did for during um, developing that platform. And then I will hand over to Alan. He's the responsible research engineer here on the platform and he will tell you uh, about the triple staining method that he has been developing and publishing here during the last couple of months. Um, so that's the beast. So what we have been building here during the last two years, and it finally has been inaugurated in uh, beginning of 2014, is what we call the BioCell platform. So in 2013, so roughly uh, one year before the inauguration of that platform, we have been awarded by the Parisian Alliance of Council Research Institutes, um, which is called PACRI, um, to build uh, a high throughput phenotypic drug screening platform. Um, at that time, we screened the market, we got in touch with basically all players in the game, and uh, we got offers and ideas from all sides. Um, finally, uh, we awarded the uh, consortium of uh, Beckman and Molecular Devices, which is uh, two enterprises that are under the umbrella of an even larger enterprise that is called Danaer. So basically, both of these um, enterprises, they belong to uh, the same group, which actually made dealing with 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 Beckman and molecular devices at that time um, a lot easier, because in the end you were speaking to just one partner instead of uh, 
many. Um, so um, at that time point, we've been screening the market, and um, the ideas that uh, that we got from Beckman, uh, France, uh, especially we were uh, dealing here with uh, Jean Claude Traoré. Uh, this was the the best, the, the most flexible uh, ideas uh, in terms of throughput, in terms of uh, redundancy, and uh, also um, in, uh, in in terms of the the conceptual design was 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 more clear than anything else that we had seen in that period. So we decided uh, to. Um, to build this uh, this background platform here. So this platform. So let, let me let me just shortly explain. So this platform is actually split into two physical parts. There is uh, a shielded part, which is the multiplex readout arena, uh, in which most of the analyzers are located. And there is a second part, which is entirely sterile because it is integrated. Uh, into a sterile flow hood. And this is the compound management and sterile liquid handling arena. So there's a large flexibility in terms of workflows that can be run on the platform. It has initially been built to conduct uh, whole genome as RNA screens, as well as large, small compound screens large size small compound screens. So there's two main roads, two main routes through which um, material as well as cells and compounds can enter the platform. So there is a um, let me use the whiteboard stuff like this. There is a plate hotel on that side of the platform through which all plastic material can enter the platform. And there is uh, a Biomac FXP on that side of the platform, which is doing all the cell biology up front, uh, the assays, and up front the analysis in that, in that station. So the core of all that cell biological campaigns, obviously, is the Biomac FP, FXP on that side. So this is the core machinery that we use to conduct cell culture, the plate preparation, as well as the cherry picking. Um, all the cell biology that is done, obviously, uh, here in this uh, sterile compartment, in this flow hood, is then uh, stored for incubation in two larger size uh, incubators that are integrated in that platform. Um, there is one on the bench incubator on this side, and another one on top uh, here. Um, both incubators together can roughly uh, they they can roughly offer space uh, for about 200 plates, meaning that this platform is capable to run a whole genome screen in a week. So this is what it was initially built for, and this is what we have been testing during uh, the last couple of months intensely, and this works totally fine. Um, coming to the uh, analysis machines on, their platforms, on that platform, which actually makes it um, capable of doing multiplex assays. The main readout um, machines that we have on the platform, this is a, a, a multiplate reader. This is a, a, a machine that can read fluorescence absorbents and uh, luminescence in a very quick and reliable fashion. Um, it, though, offers only uh, a limited uh, resolution because it will come up with one number per well. Uh, in addition, we have a Beckman Cyan uh, flow cytometer integrated on the platform, which is equipped with, uh, with a hyperside automatic loader so it can read 384 well plates. Um, this machine offers a higher resolution because you get one um, you get one number or actually you can even identify different uh, multiple parameters from one cell so you not get only one number per well but you get a couple of numbers per cell and then obviously the highest resolution uh, is offered by the three 
molecular devices, IXMXL, automated microscopes that are integrated on the platform. This will give you access to subcellular data. So, um, looking at these three images, the, uh, the molecular devices uh, I3 paradigm offers a very quick and reliable um, means of uh, getting an idea what's going on in your system. The um, Cyan ADP can definitely give you uh, a lot of statistical validity because it can analyze uh, a lot uh, of cells in the very same fashion to uh, underline um, your experimental findings and the molecular devices microscopes obviously uh, offer the highest resolution and the best way to identify new phenotypic changes that you might have even not expected when starting the screen. Um, the machinery actually looks like this. So we have the sterile compound management and liquid handling area on that side of the platform, which is, as I said, entirely shielded. So you can see the Motorman robot here interacting with the Biomac FXP on that side. And on the other side, as I said, the platform is physically divided into two parts. You have this shielded uh, multiplex readout arena. So you've got the shield all around because this Motorman robot's moving pretty fast, so we have to protect the scientists working on the platform. That's why this is shielded. The front view on, into the uh, laminar flow hood is depicted here, so you can see the Biomac FXP on that side, uh, which is actually equipped with two bridges. On one bridge, we've got uh, either a 96 or a 384 well head. In most cases, we have 384 well head mounted for quick transfer for uh, as RNA transfection for compound uh, treatment. And on the other hand, we've got a span 8 that uh, enables us to do cherry picking, to either rearray as RNAs, to rearray um, compounds, or to do combination screens, as Alain is going to tell you uh, in a minute. Um, so the, the, the Biomac FXP definitely is the core, the heart of the platform because this machine actually enables us to, um, to do all the, the treatments and all the cell culture and all the plate preparations that are necessary to conduct the screenings that we're doing here. All these machines are integrated by this monster on the right side. This is the the Motorman uh, industrial uh, six-axis robot, which is on a four-meter rail, and therefore it can reach out to all the machines that are integrated in that platform. The main readout machines that we are going to deal with in that talk today, this is the um, the Cyan ADP, a view of the Cyan ADP. So this is the automated uh, fax machine, the automated uh, cytometer, uh, which is equipped with this uh, automatic loader um, so that it can read 384 well plates. And this is the three uh, automated microscopes on the right side um, that we uh, use for most of the assays that we're running here. We've got the number one and two, you might see the numbers on them, that we pinned on them. We've got the number one and two, uh, which are stationary on the platform, and the number three, this is on kind of trolley, so we can use it for assay development while the platform is running. It's also equipped with a live set chamber, so we can do fancy, tricky things with this one. Where's the number one and two? This is the working horses, um, which are always running on the platform, and which, when we use them in parallel for running a, uh, for running a screen, um, obviously, they, um, they divide the time that we need to image all these images um, by half. Uh, for real large screens, we can even use the three images in parallel, um, which offers a very quick uh, acquisition of all the images necessary to, to go on with the analysis. This is now Don playing the movie, please. So what you will see in a second is the integration of the 
uh, machines via the uh, Multiman robot. Don, move it, please. I hope you could see it. Uh, for me, it was a bit, uh, bit buggy. Still, what what this movie showed was the motorman um, picking up the uh, necessary plasticware from the hotel and transporting this into the laminar flow hood, where then this uh, plasticware is being equipped with cells for the uh, subsequent assays. So what we are doing on that platform here is that we are creating data lots of data, mostly imaging data. So this is, this is really hard, heavy data. Um, so we've got the IXM XL machines, three of them imaging basically 24 seven. We've got the Cyan ADP creating also large FCS files. And we've got the I3 basically creating an exosheet for an experiment. So this, this we can handle easily. So all this data is acquired and it's stored uh, within an SQL database. So this is where the data is then processed um, first, firstly stored, then we use the, uh, the, the workstations that we have here, which all of them are equipped with the necessary analysis software. So we retrieve the data from the database, we analyze it and we write back to the database. And then we've got R scripts uh, in place that can send a database requests um, that can retrieve the necessary data and can do all the data mining and exploration of the data that is necessary to understand all the phenotypic changes that we cause via the compounds or via the SRNAs that we're using here mainly. All that data is stored uh, on a large scale uh, Dell server and we also have an Uptech server that um, we bought initially together with the IXMs because there's a, there's a very good partnership between molecular device and Uptech and they furnished a uh, a microscopy solution together with the necessary IT backbone. So the Artex server is doing all the calculations, whereas the Dell servers are storing and backing up all of the data. So coming to the assays, going a little bit into biology and the uh, assays that we're running here. So what we have been doing during the last uh, couple of years and months is that we have been spending a hell lot of time for assay development. So what we did is that we built a large scale um, battery, a large battery of fluorescent biosensors. So many of them we have established, um, we, we have stably established in uh, human osteosarcoma U2S cells because they're just gorgeous for imaging. They're large, they're flat, uh, they're very robust and easily genetic and can be easily genetically modified. Um, so what we did is that we constructed most of the um, fluorescent reporters in lentiviral um, vectors and then we transduce either the U2S cells or all kinds of other um, human and also mouse uh, tumor cells with those fluorescent biosensors uh, which makes life easy and which makes life cheap as well because if you consider running uh, a whole genome screen using an antibody staining it's 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 a it's really a, a lot of money that you invest in in antibody stainings whereas when using the biosensor cell lines uh, we can rely on the signal that we get without any additional stains apart from uh, a simple oak stain to to light up the nucleus so we mainly use uh, fluorescent biosensor cell lines to conduct our large-scale screens, but Alan's going to tell you that we're also, because as I said, this platform is very flexible and we can adapt to all necessary workflows um, by ease, with ease. Um, so Alan's going to tell you about the method in which we use chemical stains uh, to identify cellular viability. Um, the strategies uh, that we follow for most of our screens are depicted here. So either we 
do drug repositioning assays, meaning that we use this biosensor cell lines that um, I showed you a second ago. Um, many of them couple to GFP. Then uh, we do all the necessary automation um, that we need to scale up uh, from the initial uh, SI development pilot uh, experiments. Then we conduct our screening campaigns, so meaning that we use the compound libraries that we have in-house or that we got from our collaborators at the NCI. Upon the screen is finished, we do a uh, first quick quality control, checking that the number of cells uh, was equal in all the, um, in all the uh, plates that we screened, uh, just looking that the screen went well. Then we go into detail, we do the hit identification using our R scripts. Um, whenever possible, when um, interesting um, valid hits come out, we do in vitro validations, meaning that uh, we look um, at the phenotype that has been caused by one or the other drug, and we try to reproduce this with another drug hitting the same target. Um, we do in vivo validations, meaning that we use that drug that we initially found, and we use this in vivo, in animals that, uh, for which we run the experiments here in-house, because we've got uh, a large mouse facility uh, downstairs here in the basement. And whenever possible, we conduct retrospective clinical studies. So this is a workflow that uh, we have been following in a science transnational medicine paper from 2012 in which we identified cardioglycosides as being very capable of inducing immunogenic cell deaths uh, during cancer treatment. And there we actually had access to retrospective clinical data from the Gustave Roussy uh, hospital. So we analyzed patients that have received cardioglycoside during the cancer treatment that they have received here, and we um, we control those with patients that have only received chemotherapy, but no cardioglycosides. And we found that the patients that have received actually cardioglycosides during the chemotherapeutic treatment, because they were suffering of two diseases, cancer and heart disease, they were actually doing better in terms of cancer, at least. They were actually doing better, and they had a higher, uh, they had a better um, clinical prognosis and uh, a an, an more extended lifespan as compared to the ones that have only received chemotherapy, which is an amazing finding. The other strategy that we're following here mainly is the RNAi screening approach, which basically all of you know, I guess. So again, we use the biosensor cell lines that uh, we have initially developed. We do the necessary automation. We run the screening campaigns, do the QC, and go to the heat identification. As we do pool screens, mainly we do the deconvolution, meaning that we get uh, four to six uh, oligos hitting the same target, and we deconvolute uh, the pool screen that we did uh, initially, and then um, we're going to validate our findings either by SHRNA or uh, by this more more famous, more chic uh, gene editing now using CRISPR or Talen constructs, and then we do the necessary rescue experiments to publish this, uh, to publish this uh, in, a, in a high impact. So with this, I would like to finish the introductory part of today's webinar, and I would like to thank our industrial and academic partners. Um, this platform actually has been built for two reasons. One is academic uh, research, and the other one is being able to offer uh, a drug screening platform also to uh, industrial partners. Many of them, like uh, GSK, Genentech, Pharmamark, uh, or Lytix, Aliquid, um, have been collaborating with us in the past, and we have also been working with academic partners here uh, from the Institute Cochon here in Paris, uh, obviously from the Gustave Fossey Institute, and from other INSEM research units. With this, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk today to introduce the technical aspects of our platform. And I would like to hand over to Alan now, who's going to
tell you all the details about the triple staining methods and about the multiplexing capabilities of the Biosel platform here in Paris. Thanks. So, hello everyone. So, thanks Oliver for this introduction uh, to the platform. So, um, now that you are all familiar with the platform we're working on, I would like to give more details about one method we've been, one hyperloop method we've been implementing on the platform, which is the, a method that allows quantifying the cell viability by simultaneous triple staining. So before talking exactly about that method, I would like to go back uh, uh, on the topic of cell death. So f because during last decades, uh, all the scientists agreed on some facts, but defining cell death modalities is still a matter of debate. But during the last decade, they all agreed about, um, about defining it thanks to morphological changes and a biochemical characteristic. So now, assessing cell deaths uh, is something kind of, is not exactly done in the same way in all labs. The most widely used method is a simple method that allows distinguishing uh, dead cells uh, using, for example, the, uh, the morphological, morphological feature that show that membrane integrity is, uh, is, is corrupted and that any dye can enter the cell, which would be rejected normally. Um, so this is what I call a 1D analysis. You simply differentiate a dead cell from a living cell. But more and more people are using a 2D analysis, meaning they are adding a dye that allows to distinguish among a living cell the dying cell to, uh, from healthy cell. Because we have been uh, we have been uh, discovering. Uh, some uh, biochemical pathway that show that the cell is doomed to die. And here you can see that I mentioned two uh, examples, which are the massive activation of caspases uh, and also the loss of transmitochondrial uh, potential. These two events uh, show that the cell is doomed to die and is dying. And using a 1G analysis and distinguishing on this living from dead uh, will take this cell into account, which is a wrong way to assess cell viability. Um, so, like I said, uh, we have been more and more using 2D analysis, but now we are going to a 3D analysis, meaning we are not only using two dyes, one to distinguish dead from living cells, but also uh, trying to cluster uh, healthy cells in different categories. Uh, for this uh, purpose, we were using three different dyes you can see on the slide. So, the pound stress, the, uh, what, what the cell can die. So, it's simply assessed using, for example, the DAPI, the DAPI dye, which enter the cells only when the cell, uh, the cell membrane, uh, the cell membrane integrity is, uh, is, the cell membrane is destroyed, can enter in the cell and uh, fix to the DNA to emit blue fluorescence. This is simply a way to distinguish dead cells. And among uh, living cells, uh, we can also distinguish two different phenotypes, uh, which is the loss of transmitochondrial potential, as I mentioned above. And this can be seen using the dioc, uh, the dioc uh, dye, uh, which, which enters spontaneously in the cell and accumulates in the mitochondria when this one is still working and has an intact transmitochondrial potential. When a mitochondria upon stress will, lo will lose uh, the, uh, the potential, the dioc uh, dye won't accumulate anymore in the mitochondria and will lose the dioc signal. And the third dye we're using is Yopro. Uh, simply upon stress, there are some caspases that can be activated, activated and one of these caspases is the caspase 3, which is the effector of, uh, of, the cell, of some cell based modalities. And this caspase 3 can activate channels, which are called panexin channels, which let the Yopro dye enter, which will then fix to the DNA and emit a red signal. We have been simply used this three channel because uh, they are 
given their spectral property, they are totally compatible and they, they are no leakage from one to the other regarding um, excitation or emission. So this slide now is simply to show you the necessity of fusing three dyes instead of two and even more instead of one. On the left, you can see a typical uh, standard 2D analysis, uh, fax analysis using the JAPI dye, which allows to distinguish dead cells from dying or healthy, and the DIOX signal, which allows to distinguish to cluster healthy cells. And here, you can see among healthy cells, there are about 100, uh, not 100, sorry, 81 percent of healthy cells and if you add the Yopro dye to the same uh, to the same sample, you will see that that population, which has been clustered at healthy, is in fact is a dying population. And this um, this is uh, something like 15 percent of the total events, meaning that this 2D uh, 2D analysis is uh, can introduce wrong results by uh, distinguishing healthy cells which are not uh, healthy, in fact. Uh, so this was a, a facts analysis, uh, which is almost of the time regarding uh, only the percentages of this population. And now we have been also focusing on the absolute numbers, because we can have exactly the same percentages among population, but with different numbers. And we've been assessing these numbers uh, both with facts and, cytom uh, and uh, microscopy using molecular device IXM machine. And thanks to that machine, we were able to distinguish three, uh, in the end, five different phenotypes. So if you look on top left, you will have the dead phenotype, and on top right, we have the healthy phenotype with three intermediate uh, phenotypes which correspond to the dying uh, statuses. And in the 2D analysis, one of these three, you can see on the right, uh, was included in healthy, and in fact, it's not. And the, uh, the graph, you can see the bar plot, you can see uh, down on the slide, is uh, uh, a graph showing the dose response effects uh, after treatment with oxaliplatin and storosporin, which are two drugs inducing cell death. The first one is inducing uh, immunogenic cell deaths. Uh, typical cell deaths we've been to dying in our lab, and storosporin is inducing uh, is inducing an apoptosis event. So we can easily see the dose response, which is which is really beautiful, showing that this method is really accurate. And if you're interested, you can also see the effect of ZVAD, which is an inhibitor of caspases. So it inhibits the uh, apoptosis, and so the storosporin effect you can also see on the right of the graph. So now I've presented you uh, the method and the necessity to use a 3D analysis for assessing cell viability. Uh, I would like to show you how it has to be implemented on the platform. Because from the assay you're doing manually to the high throughput screen, there are a lot of work to do. And the method has to be simplified as much as possible so that it turns viable uh, regarding the number of plates and the number uh, of, of um, condition you want to assess. So here you can see the protocol which is followed. Simply on the platform, we're going to see the cell using this multi-drop uh, device you can see on the left. After this, after seeding and incubation, you will treat the cells. And this is where the, me the method is really flexible because this cell treatment can be a chemical, simple chemical treatment with chemotherapeutic agents, for example, or a matrix treatment, uh, which I talk more about uh, in the following slide, to study drug-drug interaction uh, or SRN interaction, uh, sRNA uh, transfection, and so on. After this, uh, the cell will be incubated a certain number of hours regarding the effect you want to see. And the cell will be detached in case of fax analysis or not, in case of microscopy analysis, and stained uh, with a simple addition of medium containing the three dyes I've mentioned before. And after this uh, staining, which lasts only 20 minutes, you directly assess cell viability using fax or microscopy. 
Um, so I want to go back on the necessity of making the, the protocol uh, as simple as possible. Because here you can see the, um, the, the plan of the platform Oliver showed you before. And for only one plate, so 196 well plate or 384 well plate, you can see now all the movement which are performed by the, the, the motorman, the, the arm, the robotic arm that take the plate. Uh, so you can see this is kind of tricky even, it's a, this is a long, uh, there are lots of movements and the length of the movement is also long and this is around 20 movement for only one plate. So simply if you want to uh, assess uh, some hundreds condition, you will turn to 20 plates, so 400 movements which will make the, uh, the essay really long. Fortunately, uh, all these movements are controlled via the SAMI scheduler, which, has, which, is, which is a software uh, written by Beckman, which optimizes every movement which is done, um, which is done via SAMI and uh, via the Motman. And thanks to this software, we've been able to implement the method in a high throughput fashion. So this show that we can use, um, you can use the platform to assess a lot of plate. But the other uh, point I want to, 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 to point out is that uh, this platform also allow you to perform really accurate uh, experiments. Uh, so in a couple of minutes, uh, you will see a video that explain, uh, that show what I'm gonna explain. So I want to go back of this famous matrix treatment I showed you before. The matrix treatment is uh, a treatment which is done to study drug-drug interaction. So the, if you have two drugs, they can have an additive effect regarding cell deaths or an antagonistic effect, meaning that the, the effect of both drugs would be less than one and the other separately. Or hyper, hyper synergistic effect, sorry. Which, uh, which will mean that the effect of both drugs is higher than the drug taken separately. For this, you have to dilute the first drug uh, in different concentrations. So you have to do a raising concentration of one drug and raising concentration of the second drug and mixing all of these drugs uh, to do a matrix of concentration. And I can assure you that this experiment is really tough and hard to do manually uh, because this needs to be really accurate and the reason is that after this we need to build a dose re response mod model which has to be as, uh, as um, accurate as possible to compute combination index to study synergistic um, interactions. And uh, the biomech is, so we, which is dealing with the treatment, is doing this, ex this thing in a really, really accurate fashion. And you're going to see it on the movie that Don is going to play. So you will see that uh, on the upper part of the screenshot, you have the met method which has been written in SAMI. And in the lower right part, you will see a simulation of the deck on the biomech, which is performing the... Um, the uh, matrix uh, treatment. So, Don, if you can please play the video. Okay, so I think you all hearing and listening to me uh, now the video is done. So this movie showed you uh, what the deck is actually doing uh, regarding cell treatment. 
And uh, I want also to mention that all these wells, which are piped in the plate you're furnishing, are tracked, uh, are tracked by the, the robots. And uh, oh, we can keep the track of, this, um, of the well which has been piped uh, in the SQL database, which is linked to the SAMI software uh, for further analysis and to keep a record of all that is doing, uh, that is done. So this, uh, this treatment, and so I, I, I'm going to skip one slide and go back to it after. Uh, this treatment would allow us to build what you can see on this slide on the left. So we have been using this, uh, this method to study the interaction between two drugs, uh, which are PG and CDDP. So simply one drug, CDDP is a drug which is killing uh, a chemotherapeutic agent which is used to uh, kill uh, cancerous cells, and PG is an inhibitor of PARP, uh, a PARP system, which is a system that allow uh, repairing DNA. And we have been showing that cisplatin is using this PARP system to uh, kill uh, the cells. So we, we were uh, emitting the hypothesis that these two drugs together could uh, could interact and uh, have a synergistic effect, which was the case because, so you can see on uh, the two uh, curves that uh, show the dose response for each drug. So you can see that this is something really accurate with small standard deviation. And this model, our log linear model, which we're computing using R, just to mention it, and uh, this is something which is really complicated to get uh, manually. And thanks to this dose response model, we have been calculating combination index for different, uh, for different uh, mix of uh, drugs. And we, uh, we, we, sh we found the result that in some, uh, some uh, conditions, so with low concentration, these two drugs are indeed uh, synergistic. Um, so this was to talk about really the accuracy of the platform. And now if you look on the right of the slide, uh, you will see another assay uh, which has been performed using the triple staining method, which is uh, the aim was to, um, to, to, to distinguish a differential sensitivity to chemotherapeutic agent between three uh, isotypes of cells. So white up and other which were uh, mutated uh, for some genes, and uh, we've been assessing three uh, around 100 chemotherapeutic agent with three concentration among three lines in quadruplicates. Meaning this was something like more than 1,200 wells, and this uh, was able to we were able to do so with uh, the platform in a really uh, quick uh, manner. And uh, the uh, results were assessed using also a platform, but a virtual platform, uh, an analytic platform using R. Uh, so here you can see um, a, a scatter plot that uh, show all the events from the, um, the assay. So all the information we got from all the drug treatments, and in x-axis you can see the dioc fluorescence uh, against in y the urged intensity and we were able to quickly cluster and count uh, the difference from every population thanks to a tool we've been developing uh, simply if you click uh, on the on a point on the scatter plot it will retrieve the cell in the sql database its position and will surrogate the database and go check the uh, cell image in the storage location. And it, with that tool, we are able to quickly distinguish, for example, here on the three cross, uh, we are able to distinguish three different phenotypes of the cell. And this is the, uh, the, the way, the tool we use to distinguish the previous phenotypes I show you. And this uh, virtual analysis platform uh, can be used with any parameter from facts or from microscopy. And uh, for microscopy, this is really useful because we can not only use the fluorescence from dye, but also assess the shape of the nucleus or its size as well as the different uh, shape factor, uh, elliptic factor, 
it can be used to, uh, to improve the clustering of data. So in conclusion, uh, I just want to say that this method is really simple. I mean, the protocol is really simple if you want to do it manually. And this can be easily uh, scaled up to, scaled up to a, a robotized platform because of the simplicity. It's really flexible regarding uh, treatment or uh, the, the device you're going to use for analysis, such as fax or a, micro, or a microscope. Uh, and this is really accurate because you're assessing absolute cellular viability. This method is also robust because the uh, regants we are used are well known and not prone, not particularly prone to degradation. Plus, the staining is really, really fast because it only lasts 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, and this, as I said before, this method can be implemented to any platform equipped with fax or uh, microscope. Um, so that's where I'm going to conclude for uh, the example. So I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this, um, this broadcasting. And uh, I will leave the, I don't know, <laughs> I will leave the... Uh, yes, so with, the this we will yeah, be, with, with this we will be happy to answer to all of your questions. I would suggest that Mike's going to lead us through the questions and we're going to answer to those. Yes, thank you, Oliver and Alain, for that very interesting and informative presentation. Uh, before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience that you can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. So the first question is regarding the system. Uh, basically, it seems like it's a very flexible system where, again, it can be used for any of three sort of different well or cell or subcellular level type of data acquisition. On the whole, is are most of the assays typically using uh, multiple of these, or are there a number of assays that just use one or use two or use all three of the detection systems that are on the platform? Assays that we are using Hope you can hear me. So most assays that we're running, most campaigns that we're running here, are using, for simplicity, only one readout system. But we later on then go through the validation of the initially found hit, initially found phenotype. Then we switch to multiplexing assays, meaning that we use one, two, or even three of uh, the analyzers to validate this assay. But the initial screen normally is conducted with only one radar machine. In most of the cases, actually, this is the microscope that we're using. Great, thank you. Uh, we also had a couple different questions regarding uh, timing of, during, of different assays. Uh, so again, in typically for cell de death assays, timing is certainly key, obviously, the shorter or longer you expose things to compounds or uh, gene knockdowns, you would likely get different answers. But it seems like one of the very powerful aspects of the staining technology that Alain described is that it may actually expand the window in which you're looking, essentially. So you're not only looking at dead cells, but you're looking at cells committed to dying in the future. Uh, so do you guys typically only run a single time point? And again, is that due to the kind of expanded window of the technologies? Or do you typically look at different time points? Or is most of that just done uh, in some lead-up experiments, essentially? Time we are running are... Uh, time we are running... Oh. Most of the time, we are using different time points. Uh, this is a complicated thing to do, so I didn't mention it. Because uh, this is a living assay, so the cells are not fixed. So the, the entire method has to be as fast as possible to avoid a cell death, uh, which is not due to cell treatment, but which is due to the time the platform is going to take to assess cell viability. Uh, for that reason, we are defining offsets, and the platform is automatically assessing different type of, uh, offsetting the, uh, the, the, uh, the treatment of the plates so that we reach uh, a, a really accurate time point in the end. Uh, and this is something kind of complicated to do, but we've been managing to do so. Um, this to say that, indeed, we're 
always using different type funds to assess um, uh, cell deaths. But once we have found like the best concentration, killing concentration and uh, killing uh, time point, we are sticking to this uh, time point to for the following um, for the following uh, experiments. Great, thank you. Uh, that actually leads to the next question. There's a couple questions regarding uh, the staining dyes themselves as far as optimal concentrations of the dyes and also uh, are the dyes able to be used in a kinetic fashion? So essentially look at different time points or uh, over a, a time course with a single addition and then look after say every 15 minutes uh, or again, it w would the dyes themselves also induce cell death or perhaps expire over time? Um, now, you, you can't do so because uh, there is one dye which is Ux, which is, uh, which is staining the, the, the nucleus. It's going inside the nucleus and it's intercalating in the, in the DNA. So this dye is, uh, is inducing uh, breakages, uh, breaks of the DNA strands and is killing the, the cell in the end. So you cannot use, uh, you cannot just simply add the dye and wait for in a kinetic fashion. You really have to do one plate for one time point. Okay, thank you. As there's some questions regarding basically, uh, it looks like maybe is there a possibility to get more information and maybe this can be taken offline uh, regarding the data handling of the system or even if there's kind of an average cost per sample. I imagine that depends on the specific analysis that's being done. Um, but uh, maybe in, in specific to the, the triple staining dyes, uh, is there a rough idea of kind of cost per sample? <laughs> this very much depends yeah. if you would like us to run your screens or if you would try this at home. So if you would like to work together with us, which of course we would appreciate, then there is a specific terrification system which has been put in charge by the Gustav Bussi Institute. Um, so every academic partner will have to pay a certain charge for using that platform. If, of course, you want to use this triple staining in your lab, in your facility, we would be happy um, because then you might cite us when once you publish. Um, we would like to refer to the uh, triple staining method, uh, which has been published in OncoTarget this year, which is an um, Sova et al. paper, OncoTarget 2015. Um, in there, you will find all the concentrations and all the uh, references of the dyes that have been used. The dyes are not expensive at all. They are very stable and they are widely used in uh, most cell biology labs on Earth. Back to Mike. Great, thank you. Uh, another question is regarding the triple staining method. Does it distinguish between necrosis and apoptosis, or are they basically both considered uh, cell death endpoints? That is a good question. So been, we've been working more and more uh, using this triple staining method. And uh, just regarding fluorescences, uh, so meaning in facts, uh, actually it's kind of difficult to distinguish um, the, uh, apoptos the apoptosis from necroptosis. However, we've been working more and more on the nuclei features of and uh, in microscopy, uh, trying to cluster a different phenotype because you know that in necroptosis, uh, the, the nucleus is getting bigger and bigger and in the apoptosis, uh, in the opposite, this is shrinking. This is shrinking and there is also different phenotype we, we are working with which will be soon published. We've been uh, being able to discover and uh, this now phenotypes so regarding um, nuclear uh, morphological features uh, 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 help us distinguish necroptosis from, uh, from apoptosis. Well, actually, while combining these three dyes, you can easily distinguish, obviously, apoptosis from necrosis. So you can distinguish healthy cells, apoptotic cells, and necrotic cells. Then distinguishing nec 
necrotic cells from necrotic cells, so the programmed way of necrosis, the programmed way of dying by necrosis. This is a little bit more difficult. And as Alan mentioned, we just lately have been developing a microscopy-based uh, method, an essay that's soon going to be published, uh, by which, even using this combination of dyes, we can distinguish healthy cells from apoptotic cells, from necroptotic cells, from necrotic cells. Back to Mike. Great. I think we have time for one more question. And again, I'll try and merge a few different questions. There's a number uh, regarding the different types of cells that have been tested with this application. Uh, one has been asking as to whether it's been tested with either T cells. Uh, some are curious about whether it's been used with primary cells and also whether there's been any attempts to uh, use this type of assay with uh, 3D cell culture uh, for the imaging applications. Um, so I could start answering that question. So this platform, I guess Alan then will specify for the triple standing assay. So the platform actually has been used with multiple types of cells, with adherent cells, non adherent cells, even primary cells um, that we obtained from the um, Gustavo C clinicians. Um, um, there also was one question which I've seen here is if we can run antivirus on that system, and uh, well, indeed we can. So the at least within within the cabinet, so this is an S class two uh, cabinet, so we can handle antivirus screens in there as soon as everything that leaves the shielded area is fixed and sealed. Um, in regarding the triple staining assay, this has been done on. Different cell types, if I remember correctly. For the triple staining? Well, for the triple staining, we've been uh, testing it at uh, not more than two different cell lines. We've been testing on established uh, cancerous cell line from human, so U2OS, and we've been also assessing uh, cell deaths in meth uh, cells, as well as MCA cell, which are uh, cell lines from mouse, and we've been also testing it on monocytes. Uh, so a uh, primary culture, and it was working in, for all the cell lines we've been using. Okay, well, with that, I think we've pretty much reached our time limit. Uh, we will certainly try to include answers to the questions we have not uh, gotten to when we send out a copy of the presentation. Uh, but with that, I would like to thank the audience for their questions and their participation in today's event. I would also like to thank Beckman Coulter for making today's educational webcast possible. And most importantly, thank you to Oliver and Alan for their excellent presentations. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on the LabRoots website for six months. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you again for joining us today. Goodbye.